from the city that never sleeps. 17 miles from Madison Square Garden, New York City. It's America at Night with Rich Valdez, America's favorite late night talk program, featuring interesting guests from around the world and calls from across America. And now, here is your host, Rich Valdez. Hi there, good evening, and what's up, America? I am Rich Valdez, Valdez with an S, at Rich Valdez on all of the social media. And uh, happy to be here with you. It's uh, Tuesday night, only Tuesday. This is what I think they call the dog days of summer because it, it's just kind of dragging, but it's good weather. Anyway, uh, if you want to join the program tonight, you're welcome to do so. 833-4825-337-8334, Valdez. I am Rich Valdez, at Rich Valdez on all of the social media. I hope you chime in there as well. And we have a bit of uh, breaking news. Not, maybe not breaking. I mean, it's from a couple hours ago. Uh, but so here is the news. And we don't have the breaking news music, so I'm going to do it for you. Dun, 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 dun. You know, it's that old school ABC news music. Dun, 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 dun. All right, there we go. And here's the headline. White House cocaine belonged to... Biden family orbit, and that's a uh, uh, a line from the report. The bag of cocaine that was found in the West Wing last month reportedly may have belonged to someone in the Biden family orbit, and the president allegedly knows who it is. This is according to the New York Post as of 7.30 tonight. Uh, Soldier of Fortune publisher Susan Katz Keating made the shocking claim, citing three security sources in a report published on Sunday even texting a number linked to President Biden in a bid to sniff out the culprit. The Post has not been able to independently confirm the Soldier of Fortune report, according to Keating, while the Secret Service publicly announced July 13th they had closed the investigation without identifying a suspect due to a lack of physical evidence. The authorities were able to follow enough clues to come up with a name and were confident enough in their detective work to inform the commander-in-chief. If you want the name, ask Joe Biden, one source told Keating. He knows who it is. Ooh, very, very interesting. So uh, the quote continues. It was someone within the Biden family orbit, and it wasn't Hunter. I knew that. I think I told you guys that, said the second source, referring to the president's adult son, an admitted recovering drug addict. Keating then said she texted a number provided by the White House, purportedly uh, to send Biden a text message and ask point blank. Three trusted sources tell me the Secret Service gave you the name of the person who brought the cocaine into the executive mansion. Is this true? And if so, can you please confirm the name? The message from Keating bounced back with the label not delivered. <clears throat> There's a screenshot of the text. And um, let's see. <laughs> it's so funny. So, yeah, it it, uh, it says, hi, this is the New York Post inquiring if, if this number works. And it gets uh, it comes with like a little link to something on community dot com. And it says, hey, there, it's President Biden. Thanks for reaching out. I'm excited to be connected. I'm giving out this number because I wanted a direct channel to communicate with folks like you. I'll text here from time to time and you should feel free to text me, too. I won't be able to reply to everything, but I'll try my hardest. Click this link so I can read your message and reply to you. And then they followed up saying, did the Secret Service inform you on the identity of the White House cocaine culprit? So uh, the Post uh, sought to replicate the process by texting the same number provided by Soldier of Fortune. Uh, in their article, the response appeared to be automated and uh, with a link to that community messaging platform. Last July, the White House <clears throat> excuse me, announced that Biden had joined this community platform Biden's team rolled out the um, Delaware phone number for the platform, encouraging people to be in touch. Now, Secret Service spokesman Anthony Guglielmi told the Guglielmi, excuse me, told the uh, New York Post that the Soldier of Fortune claimed that the uh, agency identified the cocaine's owner and briefed the president was false. So that's the official claim from the Secret Service. The Secret Service does not know who transported the small bag of cocaine into the White House. Mr. Guglielmi said, our investigation could not lead to a person of interest 
and there were no discernible fingerprints or DNA that could be recovered from the packaging. He added, uh, our source is the independent crime lab from the FBI. This institution is not affiliated with the Secret Service or the Department of Homeland Security. The FBI is nationally accredited in this area of forensic science, and they conduct, uh, conducted a very thorough analysis of the packaging. So, conflicting reports on the whereabouts of, of the owner of the, the identity and the whereabouts of this person uh, who owns this bag of cocaine and left it in the White House. So, as that develops, we'll let you know. Uh, but apparently, it still seems to be a little bit in, uh, in flux from what we see here. Let me see if there's any uh, final update on that. Yeah, that's where we are with that. So, excuse me, as we uh, get more, I'll keep you up to speed on that. Now, I also wanted to get into a little bit of what we're going to get into tonight. And that is, there's a lot of talk about the gag order on President Trump. I want to speak with um, the law professor from Cornell University, Professor William Jacobson. He's the founder of EqualProtect.org. He's also the founder of Legal Insurrection, a uh, really, really good um, legal blog. And we're going to talk about the implications of that. Plus, I want to talk about the defense that uh, Trump's legal team has mounted as well and, and the implications of that, uh, because it seems that while we're trying to try the case in the court of public opinion, many of us don't really get all of the picture because we're only given one side by the media. I also want to talk a little bit about, let's see, what's this? Oh, immigration. Yeah, the border, wide open still. Nothing's really changing there, but things are, well, nothing changing in terms of getting better, but definitely changing in terms of getting worse. So uh, we're going to check in on that as well. And finally, we constantly hear about Generation Z and how they're different. And listen, they are different. I have, you know, I have kids that are Generation Z. And I can tell you, not every Gen Z kid is is the way that they're described, but it is a challenging generation, especially if you're a Gen X or, or a boomer or somebody else, it's going to be difficult to see eye to eye because so many of these kids grew up with, you know, with a level of technology that none of us, you know, we're still getting used to. And this is all they know. So they're a lot more attuned with their, with their feelings. And that seems to be pouring into the workplace. So we're going to get a, a little bit of a report on that as well on the millennials and Gen Z uh, employees that are rejecting work assignments and turning down job offers because they'd rather have a purpose. And listen, I get purpose. I totally do. I love my job. But that's uh, where we're at right now. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to take a quick pause. We're going to come back. We're going to dig into this, uh, the latest on the, the Trump legal front, and we'll continue from there. If you want to give us a call again, 833-482-5337, 833-4-VALDEZ. This is America at Night with Rich Valdez. Well, thank you, Rich, and thank you for everything. I know you very well, and I have I listen, but I have a lot of people that listen, and they love your show, and I appreciate it very much. America at Night with Rich Valdez. Jerry, just remember, it's not a lie if you believe it. Of course, that's George Costanza on the TV show Seinfeld. And that was a clip that was in an article that I, I recently read by Professor William Jacobson. He's the founder of Legal Insurrection and EqualProtect.org. He's also a uh, clinical law professor at Cornell Law School. And it, it was a great article, and I, I can't do it any justice by, by trying to summarize it. Uh, but I can give you the headline. It says, Trump lawyer. The defense is quite simple. President Trump believed in his heart of hearts that he had won the election. The George Costanza defense. It's not a lie if you believe it. And while there's a there's a, you know, tidbits of humor in here, um, it, it's a really well put together article. And it, and it begs the question of, you know, where is the crime and are Democrat prosecutors manipulating these Republican primaries? And uh, to get to, to the bottom of this and to explain the article and um, the Costanza defense, we've got Professor Jacobson with us. Professor, welcome. 
thanks for having me on. You bet. So I, I read your article, and I think it makes sense. And it's kind of in line with the way I was looking at this. Like, you know, you, you can't, you know, I, I've been known to be a, or at least called a jerk from time to time. I know to the shock of many. But I, I don't think you can put me in jail for being a jerk. But that seems to be what they're trying to do to President Trump in many ways. And I think I'm oversimplifying it. But when it comes to the defense, uh, Jim Laura was on television and he's been uh, I think that's his name, right? Uh, the attorney, Laura, John, and John, Laura. John, Laura, forgive me. And and he I think he's done a very good job articulating uh, his defense and and, you know, kind of um, making sense of the legalese that that we hear. And um, I get the the crux of his argument, which is that they're going after political speech. Others disagree. What say you? Well, it's a combination of of all of the above. I mean, the curious thing to me, the thing that really jumps out to me from the indictment in the District of Columbia, of course, we can't just say the indictment because there were three of them now and there's probably going to be a fourth next week. So we're talking about D.C.'s indictment regarding efforts to overturn the election uh, uh, is what is not charged. It's like the dog that didn't bark. The one thing that is not charged is inciting the January 6th riot, incitement Mm. to violence. That is not charged. So you have an entire indictment trying to put somebody in jail, put a major political candidate in jail during an election year Mm -hmm. uh, for interfering with the electoral count. And that's what the indictment comes down to, is that Trump and others hatched the scheme to interfere with the counting of electoral votes. And they allege they did it many different ways, you know, phony legal theories, Um, false statements of fact, creating, you know, electors who were not duly authorized by state law, all of those things. But none of those things actually prevented the counting of the votes. What prevented the counting of the votes was the January 6th riot. And that's Mm. the one thing Trump is not actually indicted for. And so that from that flows a lot of other things, a lot of other legal issues that I have um, and that's where you get into the Costanza defense and other things is they've contrived. And I think <clears throat> most fair minded lawyers, whether you like Trump or hate Trump and right. you know, a lot of lawyers hate Trump, um, sure. would say that, you know, the charges against him are novel applications of the conspiracy laws of the, you know, conspiracy against rights, which is the old civil grew out of the Civil War era protection of voting rights of freed slaves, um, that somehow what he was doing would interfere with people's constitutional right to vote, et cetera. Um, These are all very, you know, tenuous. I'm not saying they're not going to survive and he's not going to be convicted, but they're not clear. Uh, The one thing that would have been clear is we are indicting Donald Trump for inciting a riot for the purpose of interfering with the count of the of you know the electors that would have been clear and straightforward but that's the one thing they haven't done wow so how do how do how does this play out and again i know you're not the judge or, or the jury here but again to to me the layman i look at this and i put my political analysis uh to it and i say hmm to me this seems like they're playing politics through lawfare and they're trying to uh, slow down the campaign put a black eye on trump tie him up with spending money on his legal defense, tie him up with being in court, drag him through the mud by, you know, constantly being indicted and et cetera, and that having that type of negative press. And while he's kind of managed because of his P.T. Barnum-esque uh, personality to turn that around and turn it into a fundraising opportunity, nonetheless, I think it is something that could be very detrimental to a campaign. And I think that's the whole goal. And when you look at the, at least when I look at this guy, Right. I, I say uh, this prosecutor Smith, um, he's got a pretty good track record of over prosecuting and then getting things overturned. So it seems to me like they picked the right guy to just slow Trump down. Nothing really happens in the end. It'll get overturned at some point, whether it's through an appeal or, you know, the Supreme Court and whatnot. And and no harm, no foul, except for we slowed down your campaign and hopefully you don't win. That's how I see it. Uh, do, do you think that there is any merit to that? Well, I think we may have the law of unintended consequences. I think you're right that the intention by at least the prosecutors is to interfere with Trump's campaign. There's no reason why an indictment for events that took place in December 2020 
and the mm -hmm. beginning of January 2021 couldn't have been brought a year ago or six months ago or nine months ago. There's no reason they had to wait until the summer in the at the start or in the middle, depending how you look at it, of the political campaign season. I mean, the first debate, and while he's not participating in it, is just two weeks away. So why did they wait so long? And you know, that gets back to the issue of are the prosecutors acting in good faith? And, and I don't see how you can look at this timeline and say that they didn't have political considerations. Why couldn't they have brought this indictment? We'd probably be at trial by now where it would be over or it would have been throw out, thrown out or appeals courts could have ruled on the legal merits. You know, the problem is, and I think one of the cases you're referring to is the former governor of Virginia, Bob McDonald, right. was prosecuted by Smith on very tenuous legal grounds, which held up in the lower courts and were reversed by the U.S. Supreme Court eventually. But by the time it got to the Supreme Court, Bob McDonald's uh, potential to be a presidential candidate was destroyed because he was right. convicted on legally false grounds. <clears throat> and that's the problem here. We're not going to know. I mean, I can sit here and say these are legally tenuous, but we're not going to know for sure for a long time unless the judge throws them out. But, you know, if the judge lets this go to trial a year from now, we're not going to know for long after that. So we're going to be in the middle of a presidential election, not knowing if, you know, the grounds on which Donald Trump may be convicted are going to ultimately hold up on appeal. But so to that extent, I agree with you. But from a political point of view, I think Democrat politicians are very thrilled with this because they're playing a double game here. They, I believe, and they've said it, some of them have said it out loud, said the quiet part out loud. They want to run against Trump. They know that will motivate Democrat voters. Democrat voters are not going to get motivated by Joe Biden or Kamala Harris or whoever they happen to put up. What they will be vote motivated about is voting against Donald Trump. They want to run against Trump. They think he's the most defeatable candidate. And therefore, these prosecutions are having the impact of raising Trump's um, uh, lead in the primaries. So the Democrat prosecutors are serving Democrat political purposes of promoting Trump to get the nomination only so that, you know, a year from now, if he's the candidate, it's going to do damage to him because we're going to be in the middle of trials. So this is this should not be happening in an election year. If you're going to bring charges against a major political candidate in an election year, you better have open and shut charges. You better have charges that are not going to take two to three years to work themselves out in the court system as to whether they're even legally valid charges. So that's what the problem is here. This is a complete disruption and manipulation and interference with the Republican primaries and potentially with the general election. Well put. Folks, uh, we are on with the esteemed professor, Cornell Law Professor William Jacobson. He's the founder of EqualProtect.org. He's also the founder of a tremendous blog, Legal Insurrection. We're coming right back. I want to discuss a little bit about what's going on with this gag order that they're imposing on Trump for saying that he doesn't like Jack Smith. He's deranged, he said. So we're going to get to that straight ahead. Don't go anywhere. Plus, your calls and more. 833-482-5337. 833-4-VALDEZ. Don't move a muscle. Keep it locked right here. I'm Rich Valdez with Professor Jacobson, and we're coming right back. The defense is quite simple. Donald Trump, President Trump, believed in his heart of hearts that he had won that election. And as any American citizen, he had a right to speak out under the First Amendment. He had a right to petition governments around the country, state governments, based on his grievances that election irregularities had occurred. He had every right to speak about the important issues that were taking place after the election. That's President Trump's uh, attorney, John Lauro discussing his defense, and uh, we're having this discussion right now with our guest, 
Professor William Jacobson, law professor at Cornell University, founder of the Equal Protection Project, equalprotect.org is their website, and, of course, the founder of the Legal Insurrection blog. Now, Professor Jacobson, we, we kind of went through the defense that uh, John Lauro just laid out, and and if there's anything you want to add to that, feel free. But I also want to work our way towards the gag order that they've imposed on President Trump, or this protective order, because of his, uh, again, exercising his free speech uh, against Jack Smith, saying he's deranged. Yeah, well, <clears throat> as of now, there's not a protective order in place. There's a proposed protective order mm-hmm. in place. What happened is, I think it was over the weekend, or maybe it was Thursday, who knows which day, but recently, Trump uh, uh, put on Truth Social, and I'm paraphrasing here, is, you know, you come after me, I'll come after you. The prosecution used that uh, to argue, to to run into court uh, within hours and say to the judge, look, you know, he's all over social media, as if that's something new, and he is making these things. They didn't call it a threat, but they called it, you know, uh, the potential that he's going to want to litigate this case on social media, and therefore, with regard to the documents we the prosecution are going to have to turn over to him in the case because constitutionally they have to turn over a lot of documents uh, both the good and the bad particularly the ones that don't help the prosecution they have to turn over and so we don't want him putting this stuff out on social media because look he's you know being himself uh and so that is what is before the court They um, want all the discovery in the case, all the documents turned over to be under a protective order, which would prohibit them from being disclosed. And Trump's response filed in court was, well, wait a second here. You know, he has a First Amendment right to defend himself. This case is already being tried in the public. The prosecutor's giving, you know, press conferences. The government is leaking things. The media is, who are we going to kid? Like, this isn't going to be tried. But what Trump's lawyer said is, look, we have no objection to the normal sort of protective order you get in a case, which is that sensitive documents, things that might disclose a witness's name or a home address, things like that, can be designated by the prosecution as being subject to protection, and then they can fight it out with the judge. But they have no objection to follow Trump to following the normal rules in a criminal case. What they don't agree is that in this very public prosecution, which was the subject of a congressional ongoing committee hearing, uh, that all of a sudden, literally everything in the case is going to be protected from disclosure when so much has come out. And and that's what the judge is going to have to decide. She has set down a hearing on it for this Friday morning. My, I don't know what she's going to do, but my guess is she'll probably err towards the prosecution side. But I don't, I'd be shocked if she issues a true gag order, which in a case would be that you are not allowed to talk about the case in public. If she did that, then that would probably... Trump's team would seek you know, intervention by an appellate court. I don't know if they would take it, but that's the sort of arguable violation of his First Amendment rights that they might try to get some sort of interim ruling on it if an appeals court would even entertain it. I'm not sure about that. Now, let's talk about that, right? Because, again, I'm just putting myself in those shoes now. So if I'm running for president and I'm also being you know, indicted on these charges— And um, maybe it wouldn't be my choice to call Jack Smith deranged or whatever, but it would totally be my choice if you're going to attack me and you're going to leak things against me. I'm going to use everything I've got, especially all these added cameras that are around me because I'm a candidate for president to talk about it. And I would think that that would be my political speech. And to think that if I complained and and tried to seek relief from the court and the court would say, I don't know if we're going to take it. uh, What what? What uh, recourse do you have if they choose not to take it and they decide to shut him up? Yeah, well, if the prosecution's upset that he called them deranged, um, think about how upset he must be that they called him a criminal. Okay, right. <laughs> exactly. so, so the prosecution can go on TV and call him a criminal, and you know, but he can't say you're deranged for calling me a criminal. Uh, so I hope the judge doesn't go that direction. Uh, you know, and. Uh, 
if Trump crosses a line into threatening witnesses, into threatening the judge, into threatening the prosecutors, and I don't think anybody's claiming he's done that yet, but if he were to cross that line, then that's a different story. But uh, they don't claim that that truth social thing of his was witness intimidation, and it doesn't reference witnesses. So uh, I, I don't know how the Trump's going to, how the judge is going to go. But this is a very unusual circumstance. Is he supposed to go to a debate? I mean, I can envision it now. You know, he goes to a debate, and any time his prosecution comes up in the debate, you know, he you know takes out a piece of tape and puts it over his mouth for <laughs> right. you know, dramatic effect. <laughs> Can't talk about it. Go ask the judge. You know, look how disruptive that's going to be of our political process. You can't have it even have – if she does that, you wouldn't even be able to have a debate that he can participate in about whether he's a criminal. Right, and in effect, that would truly be rigging the election. Well, it might help him. I mean, he has a long <laughs> history of doing, you know, turning things around. And uh, like I said, I would not be shocked. If, that, if the judge were to do that, first of all, I don't think it would be warranted. Um, as long as he's not threatening witnesses and things like that, um, you know, I don't think it would be warranted. But I think somehow he would turn it around. And I think actually the people opposing him and, you know, his primary opponent is Ron DeSantis, um, you know, hasn't focused very heavily on the charges. But at some point, people are going to want to discuss them and they would rather be able to discuss them with Trump having an opportunity to respond. Because if they're on the stage with him discussing, they know something he can't respond to. That looks kind of shabby for them. Oh, so, yeah. I don't think they'll just, score the points they're looking for. He'll score the points on that. You're attacking me knowing that I can't right. say anything in my own defense. You know, so this is just how the whole prosecution has so already interfered with the political process, and it's going to get worse. Now, how do you envision it getting worse? Because it seems like it's a it's a pretty bad situation as it is, and there's already a precedent set for it. So, like, in my head, I'm thinking— Unless, you know, somewhere they say, you know what, this is BS, this has got to stop, you're literally interfering in a primary and, and potentially uh, the entire election, this has got to stop. And if that doesn't happen and it, it stays on the books and it becomes precedent, um, I mean, is it safe for me to presume that this can be the case for every election moving forward, that we can just start having investigations and prosecutions and indictments during a campaign? Well, it certainly will be from the Democrat end that if they can get away with it this time, they will do it over and over and over again, just like they did the impeachment over and over and over again. Mm. Uh, of course, they got away with it, even though they weren't successful. But the problem with these things, when people say, oh, you know, if you do this, Democrats, one day the Republicans will do this to you. But the Republicans don't. Okay, right. That's <laughs> and the they problem. know that. <laughs> they know that. Okay. Because we're weak. The Democrats stick together. They don't have, you know, people breaking away. They don't have, you know, uh, you know, Joe Manchin and Kristen Cinema for a while were slight breakaways, but not really on political things, more on economic things. Uh, but the Democrats stick together, and the Republicans don't. There are always breakaways. You know, Republicans, particularly in the Senate, unless Republicans have a three to four vote majority, they're at the mercy of Mitt Romney and Susan Collins. And, you know, several others who just love to buck the, the party. Democrats right. don't have that problem. So, no, the Democrats will never be subjected to the sort of abuses that Republicans are subjected to by Democrats. And anybody who, you know, the argument, and it's very sympathetic that, oh, you know, if you do this, Democrats, it'll come back to bite you. They know it won't. So they're not worried about it. Professor, if you're willing to stick with us, I'd like to continue the discussion finally just into the the criminality of this, um, uh, of, of the entire D.C. indictment. Folks, we're on with Professor William A. Jacobson from Cornell Law School. He's the founder of the Legal Insurrection blog. Great blog, by the way. You should definitely check it out. And the founder of the Equal Protection Project, and that's EqualProtect.org. Don't go anywhere. We're coming right back. This is America at Night. With Rich Valdez. Call now, 833-4-VALDEZ. That's 833-482-5337. 833-4-VALDEZ. That's Valdez with an S.
America at Night with Rich Valdez. Will you seek a motion to dismiss? Absolutely, 100%. When? 100%. Uh, well, within the time permitted. This is what's called a Swiss cheese indictment. It has so many holes that we're going to be um, uh, identifying and litigating uh, a number of, of motions that we're going to file on First Amendment grounds, on the fact that President Trump is immune as president from, from being prosecuted in this way. So Professor Jacobson, uh, John Lauro, Trump's attorney, is saying that President Trump had uh, qualified immunity uh, to be immune from prosecution. He was acting in his capacity as president at the time, and they're now trying to treat him as non-president and that one doesn't equal the other. Um, Is there criminality here? What say you? Well, uh, we know what he's been charged with, and like I said, I think they're tenuous legal charges applying, for example, the conspiracy statute, um, conspiracy to defraud the United States in a political context that I don't know if it's ever been done that way. Uh, And the voting, you know, protecting constitutional rights as a criminal matter to a political issue, the way it's not normally been done before. So I don't I think the courts are going to have to sort out is what's alleged even a crime. And I keep getting back to the argument that I made earlier in the show that the thing that actually interfered with the counting of the votes was the January 6th riot. And that is the one thing he's not charged with inciting. So right. uh, I presume because they don't have the evidence to show, you know, that his speeches and things were, were other than constitutionally protected. So I'm not it's not clear to me. I can't say categorically there is no crime here. What I can say is, you know, it's the prosecution's burden to prove the crime and the indictment allegations. I don't think prove a crime. They prove bad conduct. They prove conduct I was against it publicly against on my website at the time it happened on, I think it was December 14th or 15th of 2020. I said, it's over. The electors have voted. The court cases are wrapped up. You can't keep, it's going to be a disaster if you keep trying to contest this election. And it did end up being a disaster. And in uh, New Year's Eve, 2020, I was so upset with the frivolous, um, false legal arguments made that Mike Pence could just refuse to count the electoral votes that I wrote a a post about that saying that's not true. So I was against all of these things. But I make the distinction between being against things politically and trying to punish someone with the criminal laws uh, because you don't like what they've done politically. Unfortunately, politicians lie all the time, and we don't put them in prison for it. Unfortunately, politicians, mainly historically Democrats, have contested elections, uh, have denied the validity of elections. You remember there was an effort made uh, in 2016 to claim that uh, electors did not, so-called rogue electors uh, or unfaithful electors that Mm -hmm. did not have to honor, um, did not have to vote the way the state voted that they were elected in. So these are not new things that have happened in this country, but this is the first time it's being tested with a criminal prosecution. And if you're going to do that, don't do it in the election year. Right. And, and I guess that that's the question that that, you know, it keeps ringing in my ears is is how we've seen it in the past. It, it happens and happens. And again, whether you like Trump or you don't like Trump, I think this is really just a question of, of, of fairness and and turning something that is uh, speech that you don't like into a crime or like you said, uh, bad conduct or whatever uh, it's going to be categorized as. But it's definitely from what I can see, it doesn't seem to be a crime. And it's also not the Trump legal team's job to prove that he did or didn't do something in so much as it's the government's job to prove that he did what they're alleging. And to me, it seems like they've they've got their work cut out for them because this proofing uh, to prove and find proof for this conspiracy charge, I, I think from what I understand, it's going to be difficult. Um, do, do you see them getting, um, are there any clear cut cases that you can think of where cons- conspiracy is proven relatively easily other than with like recordings and, and like witnesses? Well, yeah, I mean, you can prove things through circumstantial evidence. Uh, that, that's not the issue. The issue is whether you can have turn a political conspiracy into a criminal conspiracy. That's the mm-hmm. issue. Uh, and that's what I have a problem with. Not 
not that they can't prove it as a factual, you know, people are allowed to conspire with each other. You know, right. <laughs> I, your producer and I conspired before this call to see if I was available. There's nothing right. illegal about that. Okay. So people conspire, but the question is, are you conspiring to do something illegal? And it's mm. the illegality part that I'm not right. seeing here. Is there a crime? Outstanding. Well, thank you, Professor, for shedding a lot of light on this topic. I want to remind everybody that um, you are the founder of Equal, the Equal Protection Project. They can find that at EqualProtect.org. And if people want to follow you online or um, learn more about the work that you're doing, where do you send them? Well, uh, our main website is LegalInsurrection.com, and we also have EqualProtect.org. Those are the two best places to find us. Outstanding. Well, Professor, thanks for being so generous with your time. I really do appreciate it. Godspeed to you, sir. Okay, thank you for having me on again. You bet. My pleasure. All right, folks, your calls and more coming up straight ahead. Don't go anywhere. 833-482-5337. 833-4-VALDEZ. This is America at Night with Rich Valdez. All right, everybody, welcome back. And a quick, quick, a uh, little bit of housekeeping. I had requested a drum roll, but I asked for it too late. So you get one of these. All right, there's my drum roll. Um, so today is the day. Today is the day voting has opened for this program's nomination. We've made it to the final slate of voting for the podcast awards, the People's Choice Podcast Awards. And again, the program, this program that you're listening to, Rich Valdez, America at Night. I want to thank everybody who's listening to the program and listens to the podcast for making that possible. And now is your chance. If you have in the previous um, week or two that I've been asking you to um, register your email to vote, well, now is your chance to go and vote. You, If you haven't received the email from the People's Choice uh, Podcast Awards people, then just go to their website. And you'll have a chance to enter your registered email as a voter. You can go in and vote for the program. We're in the government and organizations category. And um, I'm, again, thankful for everybody that's taken the five, six, seven minutes that it takes to go there and log in and vote and cast that vote. Um, It shows how strong of an audience you are. And uh, I'm I'm grateful for it. So the website for that, podcastawards.com podcastawards.com. It's the People's Choice Podcast Awards. You put in my name, Rich Valdez, and you'll, you you scroll down and then you hit submit when you see Rich Valdez, America at Night. It's a little bit convoluted. It might take you a couple of minutes to try and figure it out. It's not the most user-friendly website, I have to admit that, but not that difficult. As long as you set aside, I think, like five, six, seven minutes and you'll be good to go. Anyway, we're going to continue with uh, what we're talking about. Uh, we're going to talk about the border. All right, there's a lot going on at the border. We're going to talk about that and how, um, well, well, we'll get into it in a moment. Simon Hankinson is going to join us, and he knows what's going on. He's got his finger on the pulse. Here's the number, 833-482-5337, taking your calls throughout as well. 833-4-VALDEZ. Don't go anywhere. Coming right back. From the city that never sleeps. 17 miles from Madison Square Garden, New York City. It's America at Night with Rich Valdez. America's favorite late night talk program. Featuring interesting guests from around the world. And calls from across America. And now, here is your host, Rich Valdez.
Hi there, good evening, and what's up, America? I am Rich Valdez, Valdez with an S, your liberty-loving Latino amigo, at Rich Valdez on all of the social media. And our telephone number, if you want to join our late-night national town hall conversation, you're welcome to do that, 833-482-5337, 833-4-VALDEZ. Welcome, it's Tuesday night, lots to discuss, and I want to give you a share a couple of headlines with you. Listen to this. Migrants disrupt commercial traffic trying to enter the U.S. Then there's this. Massachusetts governor declares emergency over immigrants. This is a national issue. Imagine that. Imagine the governor of all places, Massachusetts, a sanctuary state, uh, saying that they are going to declare a state of emergency over its inability to handle thousands of immigrants who've arrived after being released from federal custody at the United States-Mexico border. Saying, quote, this is a national issue that demands a national response. That's Governor Maura Healy. And she said that during a press conference on Tuesday morning. Today, I am declaring a state of emergency in Massachusetts. And uh, I think it's just so rich, right, that they're the ones that went out of their way to say, no, no, no. We're using nullification. We're going to nullify federal law here, and we are going to make ourselves a sanctuary state so that we don't have to follow the federal law, right? They said, no, no, our local police are not going to participate with federal law enforcement to to deport people or to do any of that, right? They want it to be separate. But then they go back and they say that this is a national crisis and needs a national response. I mean, you just can't make this stuff up, Maura Healy. You're a sangana. Anyway, so that's what's going on in um, in Massachusetts. And, of course, there's plenty going on with respect to the border. There's a lot of issues that are happening there. And with us to help make sense of uh, what's going on with the open borders and how that's uh, adding to just so many of the issues that we face um, is our good friend Simon Hankinson from across the pond. He's a research fellow at the Heritage Foundation with a focus on border security and immigration. Simon Hankinson, welcome back. Hey, thanks, Rich. Good to be with you. You bet. So so let's uh, dig into this. Um, when you hear that Massachusetts is saying, all right, you know, we're throwing in the towel, help, 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 no mas. Um, meanwhile, this is a problem they created for themselves. Uh, how do you react to that? Well, it, it's kind of amusing. You know, it's all, it's incredibly sad and really uh, enraging, but it's also a little amusing to watch politicians in places like Massachusetts and uh, uh, your own New York realize the consequences of their own political philosophy. There's uh, a state rep in Massachusetts who, who said, and I'm quoting, Either we have a massive spike of homelessness, or the vast majority of these people are illegal immigrants. When you notice that the shelters in the state of Massachusetts are all filling up because people from other countries are taking advantage quite sensibly of all the free stuff. That's what people do. They do that in New York City and L.A. and Chicago and any any state that, that uh, any city that offers up uh, free stuff. Yeah, you're, you're right, Simon Hankinson. And listen to this. This is in this article here in the Washington Examiner. Healy called on Washington to help Massachusetts because the state could not financially or logistically respond to the 20,000 people living in state-funded shelters, hotels, dormitories, and other emergency facilities statewide, an 80% increase from a year ago. The state's 1983 right-to-shelter law maintains that any family, regardless of immigration status, is guaranteed immediate state-provided housing. Here's a quote. It's more families than our state has ever served, exponentially more than our state has ever served in our emergency assistance program, Healy said, at the event uh, 2,000 miles away from the southern tip of Texas and from the epicenter of what's going on at the border. And, And it went on. Listen to this. We're unable to move. We're unable to move people from housing and shelter into permanent housing because of this. So instead... We've been expanding and continuing to look for housing and shelter opportunities, expanding shelter at a rapid pace, and it's not sustainable. So um, Governor Healy goes on, 
uh, saying that the state had tried to address this worsening issue at the federal level and then pushed the Biden administration for assistance to no avail. She also complained that the federal process to obtain work documents took too long and left immigrants unemployable. I don't buy that for a second. That sounds like a a, a lot of uh, phony baloney to me. Uh, Now, Lieutenant Governor Kim Driscoll, she spoke and pleaded with the public to take in immigrant families. Now, I got to ask you, Simon Hankinson, you you made some very valid points now. And and we've seen the Democrats made this problems for themselves. And now they have they made their bed. They have to lie in it. But they don't want to lie in it. They want local people to pick up the slack. And we're seeing this, not just people that are unemployable, but we're seeing homelessness kind of uh, increase and it. The situation in New York is extremely untenable, right, with the people that are, um, you know, from 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 the Ivory Coast and from Senegal and from all over the place. This is not the Northern Triangle anymore. This is a global transition, right, some sort of um, like global, global resettlement of, of refugees from all over the world that are coming into the southern border. And it's inexplicable to me. And now they're living outside one of the nicest and most iconic hotels in New York City across the street from Lincoln Center. Well, it, there's a, an old movie called Field of Dreams, and, and it was all about a guy who uh, built a baseball field in the middle of nowhere, and the, the slogan was, if you build it, they will come. And that's the way I look at this problem. The Biden administration dismantled everything that was working to secure the border. It wasn't 100 percent. It never has been. But we had secure uh, third country agreements where people, if they were trans- transiting through safe countries, um, they, they had to stay there. Um, If they were coming through Mexico, they had to remain in Mexico while they had their due process. Uh, He stopped building the wall, and he created this with with his Secretary of Homeland Security, Mayorkas, uh, what I call the Mayorkas Migration Machine, this giant, you know, tent city bus plane processing system to get people off the border on the pretext that they're going to claim asylum, even though we know from evidence and from history that about 9 out of 10 are just, you know, regular uh, economic migrants looking for a job. And sucking them up into the country wherever they want to go using uh, federal dollars that they can't afford it themselves to places like New York, Chicago, uh, wherever. So the, the Biden administration built this system, and it's not surprising that people are taking advantage of it. People aren't stupid. The word gets out. Um, life, I've lived all over the world. Life is difficult in other places, and that's the reason why we have control over our immigration. We're very generous. We let in about a million people a year. Um, but there's a limit to the ability of even the United States to absorb uh, people from all over the world, especially indigents who need social services and education and health care and the rest. It's uh, totally out of control. Simon, I want you to stick with us. I want to continue this discussion on the way they're breaking our system with this um, with this massive rush of, of just uh, illegal immigration that even the Democrats are, are shouting no more. Folks, we're on with Simon Hankinson. He's a former Foreign Service officer with the State Department. Now he's a senior research fellow at the Heritage Foundation in their Border Security and Immigration Center. And uh, he's coming right back with us. Don't go anywhere. Plus your calls. If you have a question for him or you want to contribute to the conversation, feel free. 833-482-5337. 833-4-VALDEZ. This is America at Night with Rich Valdez. Valdez. All right, America, welcome back. It's Rich Valdez and our guest, Simon Hankinson from the Heritage Foundation. We're talking about how what was once considered fringe Republican talking points, people saying this is coming to a neighborhood near you, blah, blah, blah. Well, guess what? Now the Democrats are saying that because it's happening in their neighborhoods where they made it happen. You got Mayor Eric Adams in New York City falling apart with uh, what's going on in his city with respect to illegal immigration. You've got the governor in um, Governor Healy in Massachusetts declaring a state of emergency. And and it's getting worse. I mean, things are happening in California. Things are really, um, I should say, declining fast. Simon Hankinson, um, I'm looking at your piece in the Daily Signal, and you lay this out pretty well. Um, 
for those who didn't get a chance to to, to read it, uh, walk us through the rest of it that we haven't discussed. Well, I, I sort of set the stage by describing how the, the system has been set up to, to attract people to come. Uh, there are uh, there's no border anymore. There's no wall. There's no uh, uh, people stopping immigrants from coming in, illegal immigrants, in pretty much unlimited numbers. And that's never been the case, uh, at least in my working lifetime. And then there are not just sanctuary cities, but there are states that effectively encourage people to come by providing, I mean, just to take New York City for an example, you get uh, free health care, you get a free New York City ID, you get to put your kids in public schools for free, you get free food, free accommodation, uh, free legal counsel, and they even give you the, the Bike New York uh, free bikes to use. So, you know, with, with a, an attraction like that, it's, it's really not surprising that uh, the city has gotten I think over 10% of the uh, illegal aliens that have been released off the border. So it's a kind of a toxic combination of, you know, blank checks written by states and cities that probably never imagined anybody would dare to cash them combined with a federal government that is derelict uh, in its duty. The Biden administration has uh, abused the parole system in a way that has never been done in history. And if you look at the parole uh, rule in, in the Immigration Act, it, it really is supposed to be used on a sparing case-by-case basis and exceptional humanitarian uh, and significant, mm-hmm. what they call significant public benefit circumstances. And it's being used for literally hundreds of thousands of people. I think it's about 45,000 a month now. Um, so it, it's, a, it's a combination of terrible policy uh, on the federal level combined with, uh, let's say, terrible policy on, on the local level. And the bottom line is that local taxpayers are getting stuck with the bill and local residents in places like New York, Chicago, Massachusetts, Washington, D.C. are getting stuck with the consequences. Their parks, their schools, their gyms, their hotels and their streets are filling up. Yeah. And we just saw we had a little discussion on that a couple of nights ago where um, or I think last night and and you mentioned it in your piece where. Local residents, immigrants from an actual uh, New York community are saying, you know, this school that you're trying to repurpose the school to turn it into a a shelter, uh, that's not acceptable. People are definitely up in arms and and rightfully so. So, you know, from your observation and, and, you know, what you've um, taken in on this, how do do you see an off ramp here? Do you see this getting better one way or another uh, or is it just uh, an election and uh, replacing, you know, the Biden administration that would uh, help to prevent this from continuing. You know, it, it's it's really hard to see an off ramp uh, at at the level of the, the Biden administration. Now, this is not a typical, uh, you know, Democrat administration in that sense. It's not right. as if in the past, if you go back to Clinton, you go back to Carter, uh, even Obama. You know, they, Obama pushed the rules, and he did some things that I, I certainly don't approve of. Um, but he even came out and said when he was asked, you know, I, I'm the president. I have to work with the Constitution. I can't just wave a magic wand and, and amnesty everybody I want to and let everybody that I want to in. He felt like he was constrained by the law and that he had to fulfill his constitutional duty, his oath, to try to enforce it. Biden and Mallorca seem to have thrown out, that out the window, and they've just decided they're not going to do it and see what happens, you know, let people sue them. Uh, so – I honestly, uh, unless there's a massive change of heart in the, in the Democratic Party, and right now Biden thinks that his base wants him to do this. He, he's being motivated, I think, by a small, fairly small percentage of Democrats. I don't think all Democratic voters are for open borders, uh, but they're the ones who are running the White House and the ones who are in charge. So maybe uh, is it possible people like uh, Mayor Adams um, and Mayor Bass in Los Angeles and uh, the, the mayor of Chicago and others – are going to start turning to their own party and saying, you guys have to do something about the border. It's possible if it gets bad enough, um, but I'm not, I'm not holding my breath. So you think getting, let's just say the, there's been like articles of impeachment and conversation about um, getting rid of and impeaching Alejandro Mayorkas, the secretary of Homeland Security. Do you think if that were to happen, this would issue like, you know, would it be a blow to the Biden administration? Would he have to like, you know, take inventory and say, all right, hold on, let's let's shut things down. Or would it just keep going full speed ahead? Your opinion? 
Well, I mean, I, I think he certainly deserves impeachment if anybody does. I mean, he is utterly derelict in, in his duty. He's simply not enforcing the law, and that's what he swore to do. He's not enforcing on the interior when, when people have what they call final orders of removal, like they've had full due process, wasted a lot of time and money, but the judge has said, look, I'm sorry you don't qualify for asylum. you got to go home. They're not doing it. Mayorkas was testifying uh, before the House a couple, a couple weeks ago, and he was asked, you know, how many people have you deported that you have arrested or you've detained? Uh, how many of the people with final orders of removal? How many, how many criminals? And he didn't have any answers. He said, I'll get back to you. And he, he, so far, he hasn't. Because they are, their target right now is 30,000 people that they want to deport in a year, and those are only criminals. Well, there's already 400,000 criminals on what they call the non-detained docket, so you know, running around America. These are aliens with criminal convictions and no right to stay in the country. And there's 5 million people uh, on, on the non-detained docket in total, and probably twice that many who are already you know, trying to wait to get into that system because they don't have orders yet because their cases haven't even been heard. So I, I certainly think it would shed some attention, more attention on this on the problem, and it might embarrass this, the administration. Um, but I don't know whether they would appoint someone who would actually do the job, even if uh, Mayorkas was to go. It doesn't mean it's not worth trying. Right. Yeah, no, that's, that's really fair, and I think you're, you're probably right. Uh, my, my gut tells me nothing stops this, nothing. Like nothing short of getting rid of Biden, getting rid of my, getting rid of all of them, and putting in somebody new that has a different philosophy of how to secure the border. Simon Hankinson, let everybody know how they can, um, you know, check out your articles and keep up to speed with all the work that you're doing. Sure. Well, I, I publish in, in a variety of, of uh, different outlets, but uh, the, the Heritage.org website uh, tends to have a lot of our stuff from the Border Security and Immigration Center, and I always. Uh, send my stuff out on Twitter. I'm at Watchful Waiter One, number one, uh, on on Twitter, and uh, we've got a pretty lively exchange there with some uh, uh, immigration specialists and people from the Border Patrol and, and other uh, Americans who are a little unhappy at the situation now and, and hoping things will change for the better. Outstanding. Well, thank you for sharing that with us. I appreciate you being here tonight. And folks, check them out at Watchful Waiter One on Twitter or check them out at the Heritage Foundation website, heritage.org. Simon Hankinson, I want to thank you for being here. It's always very insightful. Rich, it's always a pleasure. Yes, sir. Now, folks, straight ahead, we're going to get into a conversation on <clears throat> whether it's true or not that the younger generation, Generation Z, are they... I don't want to say lazier, but do they have a different set of values when it comes to work and work ethic that, well, causes them to work less? Are they turning down work because of their age and their pursuit of happiness in the workplace? Uh, I, I can relate to that in some degrees. I love my job and I've always worked in a job I've liked. So we're going to get into that discussion straight ahead. Plus your calls. 8334-VALDEZ, 833-482-5337. It's Rich Valdez. We're coming right back. Welcome back. So listen to this. More than half of Generation Z says renting is a better option than buying a home. Hmm. The high housing prices nationwide are leading many to view renting as a smarter move than purchasing a home, according to a report that was released on Tuesday. That's today. More than two-fifths, 44% of renters uh, surveyed by RealPage said that Renting is a better option than buying. The top reason among all surveyed was affordability. Broken down by generations, Generation Z renters led the way with 51% saying that renting was the best choice. Maybe I'll get into that, you know, the, the mechanics of the survey a little bit later. But interesting that that's the, the prospect that Gen Z is faced with, right? They can't afford to buy because it's too expensive to buy. So they'd rather rent. And that seems logical to me. Uh, what doesn't seem logical is to 
turn down work just because it's not fulfilling or meaningful. And I said, I'm the first one that'll tell you, you know, I, I think every job I've ever had was very fulfilling. I uh, even like the, my early job, first job was in Dunkin Donuts. And I was very fulfilled. <laughs> I really was because it, it fulfilled a purpose for me. I needed to make money and I, I, I made money there. But um, I get the idea of working in a, in a job where you feel like there's purpose and there's a, a mission and a, and a feeling that goes with that. It's a good feeling. But in an economy where, you know, we're not counting some of the unemployed anymore and things are moving in different directions and it's somewhat fluid and inflation is high but getting lower, I think people ought to um, get in where they fit in rather than pick and choose. But it seems that that's not always the case. So I want to bring in uh, Kristen G's. She's um, the CEO of Advising Generation Z or Gens, excuse me, and she's a author and a speaker and she does a lot on this uh, work. And uh, I'm curious to get her take on this because I think it's an interesting conversation. Kristen G's, welcome. Thanks for having me. You bet. So what's your take on this um, on this idea that the Generation Z employees are rejecting assignments and turning down offers for work because they prefer to seek purpose? You know, I think what we have to, to take in consideration, we talk about the pandemic often, but what we don't really talk about is what they were exposed to during the pandemic. A lot of Gen Zers were able to see their parents at home and hearing how stressed out they were or how um, they weren't happy. They realized that they didn't actually go after their dream job or they got all of these degrees and in, are in all of this debt. Um, going back to kind of what you were talking about a little bit earlier about, you know, them wanting to be renters, being owners, all of the responsibilities that goes in to owning a home and owning property and the requirement in order to sustain that type of lifestyle. This young generation has been able to sit back and see that see how easy the school system has gotten and not easy because work is easy, but easy in the sense of accessibility to get credentials. Most of them are able to graduate high school with a high school diploma and an associate's degree. They're able to start getting their bachelor's degree or even a master's at 24, 26, which means they're going into the workplace in, in many areas already having more credentials than their older counterparts, right? And so if I'm looking at my parents, what has made me say I want to go after a job where I might not be fulfilled? If I was to die tomorrow, if a pandemic was to come back two years from now, am I doing work that I would be proud of if I was going to be leaving this earth? Do I want to put myself in the amount of stress that I've seen my parents, my siblings, um, or, or just people around the world be in just so that I can have a lifestyle of a big, glorious house? Or do I live beneath my means travel, have fun, or work at a job that makes me see my daily impact and not just the bottom line of a brand. So organizations are going to have to be um, a lot more craftier in how they are going to, to create sustainability and longevity in employers, especially when it comes to that young generation, not just Gen Z, even with millennials. And I'm a millennial. And as you know, we started the, the workspace crazy of what are we going to do with this younger generation? They're standing up, they're doing all these things, they're multitasking, they are disrespectful. All of these things are not going to get us to stay committed to a company or a brand. And so brands that want to sustain are going to have to find meaningful work in every task to really um, attract and retain that young workforce. So I want to ask you, uh, because I find... Um... I don't know a ton of this stuff, right? So I know that, you know, I'm 45, so I'm a Gen X person, and I know I'm from the era, or at least, you know, I was taught that you get into a good company, get your foot in the door, grow with that company. That was never my experience. I never worked anywhere that long, uh, at least in, in, in for my own personal experience. I have some friends that went to work for, like, large telecom companies and are still there, and they're looking at retiring soon. I have some friends that are going to be retiring from the police and, and things like that, but it just it wasn't my lot in life. So I know that people my age still had that experience, but it's it was dissipating for, for some of us. And, and I just wonder, it, employers, corporations, whomever, uh, small businesses that are looking to hire Generation Z, 
they may, like you just said, need to make these adjustments if they want to attract and retain these people. My, my question is, do they want to attract and retain these people or like maybe go the way of Walmart, right? Just as I know they're a big employer. I don't see a lot of Gen Z or some millennial, but not really a lot of Gen Z, but I do see a lot of Gen X, baby boomers that are working uh, all sorts of shifts there. And, and I wonder, is that a like a, a take on Walmart going after those people because they feel like they gravitate to the work better or they appreciate their work ethic better, or easier to deal with, or that's all they can get? What do you think? I think it's a little, I think, you know, without being insulting to the older generation, because truthfully, the idea of going after meaningful work is only afforded because of the work that the older generation has created, the foundation they've they've laid, Mm -hmm. the reason why things are accessible. So I think Walmart has done a fabulous job in finding their core audience. But we also have to realize a lot of the things that you buy at Walmart is a lot of the things that Gen Zers, um, yes, they're eating food, but are they really the ones cooking the food? Are they really the ones buying the furniture in the home that they're renting? You know what I mean? So Mm -hmm. they're targeting their core audience that's going to put money and dollars in their pocket that are looking to stay when they're buying for their home. Right. Whereas I think when you look at corporations that are, you know, a fortune 500 company that might actually be an office setting or even a trade setting like transportation or finance, or even, you know, working in, 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 in some of these healthcare, you know, areas, you're going to have to think about, you can't just target an old demographic because truthfully there are some job functions that is going to require innovation. And we know that as you get older, it's harder to embrace change. So you can't, you know, companies aren't going to be successful with that. Now, the great thing about the old generation is just because you get old doesn't mean that you no longer matter. doesn't mean that you no longer work. But what it does mean is that you may not be standing at the podium of where you are today, five years from now. So if companies aren't preparing for the, the handoff between generations, and it doesn't have to skip from somebody who's 45 to 25, it could be somebody who's 35 in between that right. mark, right? But if they're not prepared to even pass the baton to the next generation, are they going to die with the baton? You know what I mean? Right. Who's going to pick? Who's going to pick it who up? Who will do the work? So, who, who, you know, who's going to do the work? And, and not even that. These entry level positions that grow into that long term role, who's going to start at that role? It can't always be somebody who's forty five, who's fifty five. That person has a mortgage. That person probably has grandkids or real debt and responsibilities. They're going to want more of an income on 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 rights, and they're probably going to be coming in with t- 10, 15 years of experience. Whereas that young person might come in credentialed, but they lack the experience, which justifies the low pay, right? Mm-hmm. Because they need to gain the experience. So it's not about, you know, organizations deciding if they're going to to accommodate what the younger generations are wanting. They're going to have to if they want to sustain, you know, within the, the if they want to be around for the next 30, 40 years. Right. Your employees aren't going to live forever. So if you're not even touching the younger generation and even getting brand recognition, not just workers, but brand recognition, how will you survive? Yep. Fair point. Uh, our guest is Kristen G's. She's the CEO of Advising Generation Z and founder of Advising Gens Technology. And we're going to come right back, plus your calls on this topic. And Open Phone America is coming up at the top of the hour, so you could start getting your calls in for that as well. 833-482-5337, 833-4-VALDEZ. This is America at Night with Rich Valdez. Call now, 833 833- for Valdez. That's 833-482-5337. 833-for Valdez. That's Valdez with an S. Welcome back. And our guest is Kristen G's. And um, Kristen G's is an author in addition to the work that she does with uh, advising gens. And 
I wanted to talk about her book. She's got a book that uh, came out this year, not very long ago in April, Like Streetlights. Kristen G's, tell us about this book. Why, why did you name it Like Streetlights? Absolutely. It's after one of my most popular speeches um, that I give to practitioners or uh, in leaders that are working in, in business and are wanting to learn how to either manage or inspire or redirect this younger generation that we're talking about. You know, I am in love with Gen Z. Um, I, I call myself a Gen Z enthusiast. And so I've spent about 13 years really studying this generation. And one of the things that I've realized is there is this battle between generations. And I really wanted to create a book that would give anyone who's either raising or leading this younger generation a guide to remember that they are the lights that are going to guide this younger generation out of the darkness that was consumed during the pandemic. While we might be physically out of the pandemic and while we might be talking about the national statistics as far as depression and suicide and just mental health being at the forefront of everyone's conversation, we also have to realize that although all of these terms are being thrown around to this younger generation, that 10 to 24-year-old, we as the adults have to realize we are their everyday influencer. And if we're not remembering to be inspiring, if we're not remembering to being encouraging or affirming, then we are allowing the darkness that's happening around the world, not just about the pandemic, but what's going on with race issues, what's going on, you know, with our healthcare system, what's going on in the schools, what's going on with all of the mass shootings that we've seen. It's that type of energy, that type of consistent negativity that they can find on any social platform and even the shows that they watch, the music that they listen to, that can create a dark space for a young person on the inside out. And so as a, this book is a tool kind of guiding each each person, um, whether they are in a role of a teacher or in the role of a parent or in a role of a supervisor, to see their role as being like streetlights. They're not the only one, and it's not just their responsibility. It's one other person's responsibility. We have to collectively, as sane adults, work together to be like streetlights, where each and every one of us are shining bright during the darkest moments of that kid's life or that young adult's life so that they can see a way through it into their future. And so that, that's essentially what I talk about in a speech, and I've kind of broken it down into action items throughout each chapter, giving practical tips, insight for people that are reading to be able to actually apply in their everyday life. Give us an example of one of the tips that you're giving to um, the Gen Z folks or those that are, you know, like me, I, I have two Gen Z humans that I've been raising for the last two decades. I have an 18-year-old and a 22-year-old. So I'd love to learn something, right? Congratulations. <laughs> it's not easy. Well, thank you. It's not. Um, you know, go ahead. No, I was just saying it's just not easy, and, and, and I'll take all the help I can get. You know, I think one of the things that I, I, I talk about throughout the book and just in, in person is realizing that you don't have to minimize their experience just because they may not have had to work the same type of input that you did when you were their age. I think a lot of times when we're having conversations with young people, we tend to say, oh, well, when I was your age, I dealt with this and this and this, and I just worked through the pain. Well, the reason why there's a solution for them to not work through the pain is because you didn't like working through the pain, right? So you don't have to wear, you know, your hard work with a with an honor and a badge because you work through trauma. That's why mental health is such an issue today. So it's not a a flex or a brag. You can still talk about the hardship that you endured without bashing them or being wrong, being born at the wrong generational time in order for you to validate their experience. You know, I think that's one. I think another major one that I talk about uh, throughout the book and, and just even in consulting and, and speaking is, we have to also realize that why is social media so popular? And when I say popular, Mm -hmm. I mean, why are they seeking validation from strangers? Is it because the adults that they see every day are not giving them affirmation because we're too busy saying you're doing what you should be doing? You got good grades. You should be doing that. Came home on time. You should be doing that. You follow dress code. You should be doing that. You understood the the work assignment. You should be doing that. What if I, as adult, as the adult in their life, realizing that I'm their everyday real life influencer, every time I saw that, hey, buddy, you did a really good job. I noticed that you came in on time. I know that that you didn't have your phone on. I notice that you remember to turn the alarm on. Why is it so hard for us 
to give active affirmation to the things that they're doing that, yes, they should be doing, but should they be seaking the approval from us or complete strangers? Right. right. Excellent. So point. I think Kristen, being, hold on one second. I, I want to take a quick pause and then come back. It's, it's an excellent point you're making, but I have to beat the radio clock. <laughs> so folks are on with Kristen G's and uh, the conversation on Gen Z is fantastic. We're talking about her book, Streetlights, like Streetlights. You can check that out wherever books are sold. We're going to come back to your calls and uh, wrap up with her. Don't go anywhere. This is America at Night with Rich Valdez. America at Night with Rich Valdez. Call now, 833-4-VALDEZ. That's 833-482-5337. 833-4-VALDEZ. That's Valdez with an S. All right, we're coming back to Kristen G's. Uh, she's got a great book out, at Like Streetlights, and we're talking about Generation Z, and we've got a caller Rick in Medjet, South Carolina, WTMA. Rick, quickly, go right ahead. How you doing? Um, I love that title for the book because that's the way I grew up. What you get when you grow up as a kid, getting kicked out at 16 years old, it's work ethic. You have to pave your own way. And it doesn't matter who's in office or what's going on. You got to keep moving and keep working. There are no promises. But as long as you have that, that's what you have. I understand the street life. I totally get it. All right. Thank you, Rick. And uh, Kristen G's, I think uh, Rick and many others uh, feel that, you know, those of us that aren't Gen Z have a superior work ethic to the Generation Z employee. Do you think that's a misconception? Um, what say you? You know, I, I, I love this generation as a, as a professor and, and someone that's been working with them. I think it's going to be about building equity in the relationships with your younger workforce that's really going to allow us to see the change in behavior. As I mentioned earlier, we're going to have to realize that as much as we want to call this generation lazy, entitled, and unable to form complete sentences, many of them are on track to becoming the highest degree generation. Why? Because they do have the ability to study something. We're going to have to realize that we have to teach them what's appropriate when it comes to explaining why you don't like something when it comes in the workplace. That's our job as the leaders. I'm not saying they're not responsible, and I'm not saying that they do everything great, but I think a lot of that attitude of me being able to do better than my boss or better than the other older employees that work here is because one minute you're chastising them as a parent, and then you're asking them how to use technology. We've either got to own, <laughs> you know what I mean? We've either got to own that we're complete leaders and we don't need any help from them on how to use skills that they know how to do, or we're going to have to switch that that kind of momentum of saying, how can I build a better relationship with him? Good point. Kristen G's, I want to thank you for being with us. Check her out at Kristen G's. That's K-R-I-S-T-E-N-G-E-E-Z.com. You can learn more about everything. Godspeed to you folks. Stick around. It's Open Phone America, and it's coming up right now. I'm Rich Valdez. Live from the city that never sleeps. 17 miles from Madison Square Garden, New York City. It's America at Night with Rich Valdez, America's favorite late night talk program featuring interesting guests from around the world and calls from across America. And now, here is your host, Rich Valdez. Hi there, good evening, and what's up, America? I am Rich Valdez, Valdez with an S, at Rich Valdez on all of the social media. Your liberty-loving Latino amigo, happy to be with you this Tuesday night, 833-482-5337, 833-4-VALDEZ. If you want to join us, of course, this is the late-night national town hall conversation where uh, you guys get to be heard. You weigh in on any topic we've discussed. We've discussed lots of things tonight, and I'm happy to get into that, whether it's... Um, the conversation we had on Generation Z in the workplace with Kristen G's 
or uh, with Simon Hankinson discussing how homelessness is uh, on the upswing because of unchecked illegal immigration or the um, the legality or lack of criminality in the D.C. indictment against former President Trump. Uh, we got all of that, plus whatever you want to bring to the table as well. 833-4-VALDEZ is the phone number. Uh, but I want to bring a couple of stories out. There's a few things that are interesting on this, <clears throat> on the uh, on the list of uh, articles that I've got today. Uh, white people are expected to lose majority status in the United States by 2045. Uh, saying that uh, whites would be considered a plurality by 2045, but not the majority. Then, the microphone thrown by Cardi B has been auctioned off for charity, and it brought in nearly $100,000. <laughs> so, look at that. There's some good that came out of that one. And uh, the rapper Tory Lanez, uh, he's a good rapper. He's kind of one of those rappers that sing. T- sentenced to 10 years in prison for um, shooting Megan the Stallion uh, or the shooting involving Megan the Stallion. That's uh, unfortunate. Or maybe it's well-deserved. I don't know. I didn't follow that story too well. And apparently, let's see. Well, these are a little more heavy, these stories. Maybe I'll do those after the bottom of the hour because that's kind of uh, kind of ugly, right? Some of those stories of, you know, involving child abuse and teachers abusing children and whatnot. I'm just not ready for that. But there is a food truck. A Wyoming food truck set the chicken wing world record selling 48,083 buffalo wings. And they now hold the record for that. So that's what I want to talk about right now. If you want to switch gears and go somewhere else, I'm cool with that too. But let's uh, hit the phones. I see a lot of people waiting here. Uh, We've got calls from... Let's see. We've got calls from all over the place. We've got North Carolina, Delaware, California. It looks like New York. All right, well, let's start off with um, David in San Francisco listening online. Go right ahead, David. Welcome. Oh, yeah. How are you, uh, Rich? Yeah. Wonderful, um, sir. Thank you. Yeah, I uh, was... uh, Struck by a comment that your in your first hour, the uh, the guest had a, a nonprofit. It sounded like he made up. Uh, was it something like insurrection is fun? No, it's a blog. It's a blog. Legal insurrection. It's a, he's a law professor at Cornell University, and he writes a blog. So it's called Legal Insurrection with a lot of other legal scholars. Oh, I see. So it's not a nonprofit. No, Legal Insurrection, I think, is just a, a blog. Yeah, as if it's a funny name. Uh, yeah, it's uh, that's good to hear because a nonprofit, uh, and America has been besieged with a bunch of phony nonprofits. Uh, oh, yeah, there's a lot of fraud. If you're, Yeah, if you're aware of how you get nonprofit status, you pledge that you're going to provide public good. You're, of course. You're going to do something good for society. Uh, you're going to do something that's going to make it all better for all of us instead of being some fly-by-night organization that just raises money and you get to pocket it and, and ride off in a jet somewhere. Sounds and, like politics now you're describing. Oh, yeah. And as a matter of fact, that guy that's been buying the Supreme Court, uh, Harlan Crow, um, if you pay attention to his nonprofits, he started off with a nonprofit tied with the Federalist Society. He gives Clarence Thomas's wife, uh, uh, if I remember right, it was a third of a million dollars a year to put together a case uh, which became Citizens United. And that's the one that says that you can give secret money to a politician and call it a campaign contribution. Secret money. Yeah, I remember that. I, just so you know, you, you might think I, I support that. I actually don't. Uh, I was adamantly against um, that case. A lot of people support that, that dollars or speech. And and I'm sure plenty would go against me. But I think when we did that, we kind of um, eliminated the ability for the little guy to really participate. Because now it's whichever super PAC and, and powerful campaign can raise the most money, they get the most clicks, views, eyeballs, ears, you name it. They have the most reach. And that puts a guy like me 
out of commission if I ever want to run for president. And I have no intentions of doing that. But I'm just saying maybe even somebody like yourself, David, from San Francisco, that may want to run for president. Another person that unless you are independently wealthy or have access to the people that can raise that kind of capital, um, it's not happening. And and that, I think, is the drawback of of Citizens United. I do understand that, you know, people making political contributions is is I, I understand the premise of how the court decided saying that, you know, you giving money is your political speech. That's me saying I support this candidate and I'm doing it financially. It's, it's you know, a, a very um, real form of political speech. I, I get where they're coming from, but I, I just feel like in doing so, <clears throat> here we are. It's kind of like, I guess, um, if we agree to have free speech, then we have to agree to deal with the speech that we don't like because we have free speech. You know, so whether it's somebody saying they don't like this, they don't like that, or they think I'm ugly or, uh, you know, I, I, they hate my hair, whatever the case is. The bottom line, I think, ultimately, is I have to accept the critique. I have to accept the um, the disagreement. Otherwise, then it's not really free speech. But good point, David. I appreciate the call. Uh, streaming, listening online from San Francisco to Rich Valdez, America at night dot com. And I want to remind everybody, make sure you tune in to Rich Valdez, America at night dot com. If you ever want to listen to a replay of any episode or if you missed any of the interviews that we do, you can always check out those interviews online at Rich Valdez, America at night dot com. And you could even um, download them uh, to your favorite podcast app and go right through like Apple or whichever podcast uh, platform you use. And then you can get notifications once you hit subscribe. All of it free of charge, absolutely free. Also, want to remind you, <clears throat> and thank you, today is day number one of voting. Uh, voting does close, I think, in about two weeks. Uh, I think. I have to double-check that. But I think voting started uh, the 8th of October, and it ends, um, I might be wrong. It might end on the 15th. <laughs> I'm going to double-check that. Maybe our producers can check on podcastawards.com and check out the rules tab and let me know what the rules are. I'll tell you when we come back. But, yes, we have um, this program, Rich Valdez, America at Night, has made it to the final slate of nominations that were announced on their website today. So I thank you for that. Now we're in the running and we're competing against uh, a number of other podcasts in the government and organizations uh, space, that category. I'm hopeful that those of you that registered your email to vote have received the email from the podcast uh, awards, the People's Choice Podcast Awards, and you will now cast your vote by logging in and casting your vote. It's not the simplest process on their website, but I'm pretty sure you can figure it out. If not, ask a millennial or somebody who's Gen Z. They'll totally get it. They're so good with this stuff. Anyway, um, that's the story on that. If you want to check it out, podcastawards.com. Podcastawards.com is the website to vote uh, for this program, Rich Valdez, America at Night. And, of course, we're coming back to your calls and more. We've got calls from New York, calls from Ohio, calls from Delaware, and more that are coming in as we speak. So happy to chat with you on all of the hottest stories and topics of the evening, as well as what we've discussed already. 833-4-VALDEZ, 833-482-5337. This is America at Night with Rich Valdez. Call now, 833 833- for Valdez. That's 833-482-5337. 4 valdez That's Valdez with an S. America, welcome back, and we're going to go to the phones. We're going to continue our conversation with you guys. Uh, there's a lot of uh, things that we've put out on the table, and I'm happy to have those discussions with you. Let's go to Roseburg, Oregon on KQEN. Great station, by the way. Check in with Donna. Hey, Donna, you're on with Rich Valdez. Welcome. 
Hello, Mr. Valdez. How are you this evening? Oh, I'm wonderful. I wanted to Thank compliment you. you on all the great work that you're doing for Jim Bohannon. I listen to him every night, and I That's think you're a, you. perfect, a perfect replacement, and I hope you win the award. Oh, I will be voting. I really, I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. And what's on your mind tonight? But I'm looking, I'm looking at the news, and I don't watch straight, mainstream media. Mm -hmm. Um, for the most part, I basically get my news via this station that I listen to and some things on YouTube and other things on the computer. And what I'm seeing is the more the Bidens do, the more distractions are put out. Um, like the alien, all all of a sudden they're going to tell us about aliens, extraterrestrials, not the ones that are crossing our borders. Um, but I wanted to know if all these distractions and then they're slowly leaking out information we should have known years ago that were in the works since the 60s, um, they should have told us then. And it seems like every administration has lied about something um, and hiding something. And this whole Biden rigmarole with up to $50 million that he took in – from China and bribes and this and that, um, I I pretty much think that's kind of true. Um, from all that I've read and the audio tapes that I've heard, um, and nobody's bringing it up, but they're more than happy to slam Trump under the bus one more time. And I don't believe the polls are even. Trump and Biden are supposedly even as of today, and I don't believe that either. So I'm trying to understand and listen to people like you to understand how to discern what is, in other words, what you feel is a distraction and what you feel is true news. Good. Very good observation. So I think that there's always going to be this um, politics is politics, right? So there's a lot of sleight of hand that goes with politics. Now, in addition to their politics, then there's media, right? And that's the business I'm in, uh, where I talk about politics using the media. And July and August are terribly slow news months. So you can bet your bottom dollar that you are going to hear um, aliens, uh, whatever, whatever the crazy story that you wouldn't do in April. <laughs> You're, you're more likely to, to hear about that in, in July and August because people are on vacation. There's just less news out there. And sometimes you just you're having fun in the summer and you say, you know what, let me uh, do something kind of funny. So um, it, it doesn't surprise me that they left the, um, the UFO hearing for the very end of their calendar in Capitol Hill before they take off for the summer. Clearly, that's, that's what they did. Now, I, do I think it's important? Uh, to some degree, yes. I mean, there's a lot of things that our government spends money on that we have no idea, and and it still gets spent, and nobody's the wiser, right? So, of course, we need government oversight. We should know what's going on. But I agree with you. If we're talking about aliens, there's something out there they don't want you to be paying attention to, right? It, it's just it's that big. But it because it's such an attractive, sexy topic that there are people that are just enamored with this topic, and they say, you know what? I love this alien stuff. Finally, they're going to tell the truth about the aliens. And I'm thinking, man, I'm only 45. But ever since I was a little kid, I've been hearing about Area 51 in uh, Roswell, New Mexico, that there's an underground uh, military bunker. It's been around, like you said, since the 50s and whatnot. So uh, I, I, am, I will never be shocked if Biden did a joint press conference with, with somebody that descended from a flying saucer and came down looking like um, you know, from Vulcan, you know, I, I would be like, oh, yeah, okay, I've, I've seen this in the movies, right? I've seen the Will Smith movie with Tommy Lee Jones. So that's my take on it. I'm, I'm very jaded and, and rather incredulous to so many of those things where I'm just like, okay, great, we have aliens. We've had them forever and ever. So I agree with you in that respect that, you know, there's a lot going on. And where it gets more aggressive back to the political side of things is you see that every time the Republicans have made a move and, and made any effort or headway on shedding a little bit of light and truth on what's going on with Hunter Biden and any of the scandals that he's involved, there, there's a reaction, a political reaction, 
where they come after Trump. They uh, they leak that there's going to be an indictment. They actually file the indictment. It becomes, you know, they, they I think they've all come to realize anything involving Trump, people either love him and they want to hear it or they hate him and they want to hear it. <laughs> right. They want to hear how bad it is. They want to trash him. They want. So either way, it's a win win. Trump is a winner for for people in the media. They just they love the guy. They, you know, they can beat him up all day or they could praise him all day and people love to hear it. So I think now that they've figured out that their ratings go up with Trump, then they say, okay, great. Well, then uh, if he, they're coming after Biden, that's starting to get some traction. Then let's, you know, let's throw them off the trail and use, use El Trumpito, then all this Magnus, the 45th president of these United States, as the, uh, the deterrent, you know, to going after the other one, after um, Hunter. So, yeah, I agree with you on that front. I think that's totally the case. <clears throat> now, uh, with respect to the rest of the stuff, um, yeah, I think Biden's also corrupt. I think he's he's involved in, in criminality. And I think the, the issue that happens there is it's not just Biden that's corrupt for 50 years. It's, I don't know, a good portion of the D.C. politicians that do what he does. Maybe not at the level he did because he was vice president and now president, but they're doing it too. It's the common thing to do. That's why everybody does it. So I think when you and when everybody knows that everybody does it, then it's like, hmm, well, then why is that a big deal? And like, why are you freaking out about it? And, you know, I'm sure many of us in our lives have been in a situation like that, whether it's a friend of yours that does something that you're like, oh, I didn't know you did that. And they're like, yeah, everybody does it. And you're like, oh, well, I don't. But, you know, uh, whatever that can be. Right. Whether it's um, drugs, infidelity, um, whatever, you know, cheating on your taxes, who knows? There, there's always you're always going to run across somebody that's doing something that that you might not agree with. And they're like, yeah, yeah, it's no big deal. Everybody does it. So that's my take on that. I think um, people ultimately there's a lot of people in, in this country that are very, very liberal. And they're just like, who cares if Hunter's, you know, a drug addict? Who cares if Joe Biden has some kids that are messy? Who cares? Right. The bottom line is he's not Trump. There's a lot of people that believe that. I, I don't believe that. I think we need a solid economy and we need great foreign policy. And we, we had those things with Trump. And that's probably the only way we're going to get him back at this particular point in time. Uh, but we'll see. There's a good slew of candidates and there's some debates coming up. So, Donna, thank you for the call from Roseburg, Oregon, KQEN. I really appreciate your kind words and your thoughtfulness. And we're coming right back right after this. Don't go anywhere. It's Rich Valdez, America at Night. We shall return. Breaking news for you. The Mega Millions, the largest prize in the game's history, $1.58 billion in the jackpot, has, um, has, has, has happened. They have drawn the numbers. That's what I was waiting for. I was waiting for words. <laughs> and uh, the lucky player could claim the largest Mega Millions jackpot in history as the grand prize. 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 Excuse me. This happens after midnight. Now, it's at uh, $1.58 billion, an estimated cash value of $783 million. And that's uh, tonight's drawing, Tuesday night's drawing. So just imagine that for a second. And listen, I know you want to tune in and talk about the political topics and all the hot news stories. But this is one of those things that I know this comes up at every lunch with all of your friends, right? Because my friends ask me, this: what do you do if you hit that big? Right. Imagine yeah, you hit the one point five eight, you pay Uncle Sam and your state, Biden, whoever else has got their hand out, and you walk away with seven hundred and eighty three million dollars. What do you do? Now I have a brother that hit uh 
a few million dollars on a scratch-off ticket. And uh, life's been great for him. <laughs> but I got to tell you, um, $700 million, well, that's a whole different story. So what does one do? Anyway, here are the numbers. I don't know if you're interested in hearing them from me. I'm not like the um, the person on television. In New York, there used to be a really pretty Puerto Rican woman that would come on and she would say, Hi, I'm Yolanda Vega. I don't know if you're in New York, you, you, you thought that was funny. If you're anywhere else, you're thinking, who cares? <laughs> but the numbers are 13, 19, 20, 32, and 33 with a mega ball of, drum roll please, 14. The mega plier was 2X. So those are the numbers, 13, 19, 20, 32, and 33 with a mega ball of 14. I hope everybody won. I hope I won. I, I actually bought a ticket for this. So I hope that uh, I also won. And I hope we all won. And we'll all find out soon when I get my ticket after the show. I'll let you know if I won. Anyway, let's continue with our calls. I see calls are coming in right now as we speak. Let's go to Doc in Wilmington, Delaware. Go right ahead. Rich, I can't. I cannot add to what the lady from Oregon said about you. You are the natural choice to see Jimbo again. I'll say it again. Westwood one hit out of the park with you, my, my amigo. You are. You are all. You are cranking all eight cylinders. Now to my thank topics. You. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And thank you for taking my calls always. Now my then, pleasure. to my topics of the indictment. I agree with Dr. Alan Dershowitz. It will go to the Supreme Court. The Supremes will throw it out and rule it in Trump's favor. He will be a hero to the masses and to the base. He must broaden his base as he did in 2016 to win this thing, however. That's been a good running mate. And there's, there's an 800-pound grill in the room nobody's talking about right now, and that is foreign policy and defense policy. What should it be long term? In past, in past uh, elections, that was a hot topic. It's not being talked about in this election except for border security by the Republicans versus the Democrats. That's part of, part of what it should be. We have to have a national debate in this country. 10, 15, 20 years down the road, what should our overall foreign, po foreign and defense policy be? Nobody's talking about it right now. If somebody starts to talk about it, they could be, they could be the front runner on the Republican side or the, or the Democratic side. And again, if Joe Biden has a Mitch McConnell moment, it's all over for the Democrats. The, the, <laughs> the, the, the convention will be wide open, and they'll pick somebody other than Biden. That's my theory. Well, let me ask you, uh, Doc, um, with, with respect. Cause I, I mean, I think I've heard... Um, Different people talk about different things. Uh, I, I saw yesterday some of the Republican candidates are out there meeting with President um, Zelensky in Ukraine. I think Trump has uh, laid out a very, a very clear um, map for what he plans. He, he's a pacifist, right? He doesn't want any type of war. He doesn't. Uh, he's not opposed to feeding the war machine as long as we don't go to war. So I think in his term in office, I think it was seven hundred uh, million dollars or whatever it was, billion dollars. I forget the number, but it was a huge number that he invested in in, in re-upping the things that the military needed, and I think that was a good idea because again, he he was winning on two cylinders there, right? He was winning on both fronts. On the front of we're rebuilding the American military so that we can be respected and and you know walk quietly but while carrying a big stick, and B, I'm appeasing the military industrial complex that, you know, wants to build and and create the the weaponry that we need and the equipment that we need, uh, while not ever committing to using it in theater, just saying, hey, look, we have it if we need it. And I think that's a winning strategy. Uh, and Trump, uh, that was the one he employed. So we didn't have any new wars. And, you know, there was a little bit of a skirmish where he went after the people in Syria. And then of course, um, went after Soleimani and, the, you know, these isolated incidents that occurred, but there were, there was nothing new. In fact, there was, you know, plans to, to draw down in Afghanistan should the Taliban play ball. And, you know, they had that agreement in place, that, you know, pending everybody honored their commitments. And I think a, a lot of Americans like the idea that Trump doesn't want to go to war. He's not looking to, to be that kind of president. You know, he's a moneymaker. He'd rather build a building or somehow make money um, than than have war. And and I understand his penchant for that because, I, uh, I mean, I don't know that I would always agree. I, I'd probably be a, a little bit more hawkish than he is, but I understand it and I get it. So I think he's been out there saying, you know, he would end the Ukraine war and, and you know, in a heartbeat. And I think any American president that's worth their 
you know, it's worth their salt, let's just say, um, should be able to do that, right? They should, in fact, be able to, to use the leverage of the office to bully pulpit and say, hey, look, I'm the American president and we're going to work this thing out. But I feel like Biden has just, he's really just turned a blind eye to that. And because he's, he's turned a blind eye to it, I think it's, um, it's, it's the, the cause uh, for the problem, right? They continue, Putin continues his aggression, the other one continues to retaliate, and, um, and nothing happens because there's a lack of leadership. There's like a vacuum coming from Washington. So I think that's the case. But I do agree with you on the rest. Everybody else is kind of silent on it. I haven't heard many of the other candidates really speak out on, on any really um, on any big other than Ukraine. I haven't heard of much. Uh, I, we know Trump was tough on China. There was a whole trade war. We know um, Trump on immigration. So I think Trump brings a lot in terms of foreign policy because he, he, he did a lot of it. You know, he visited Saudi Arabia. He was there. So I think there's a lot of proof in the pudding when it comes to Trump. Uh, with everybody else, not so much. At least that's my thought um, from how I see it. But I think you're right. It's an important part of what's going on, and it has to be addressed. Uh, thank you, Doc. I got to hit a break right here, but I appreciate the call. Big shout out to you in Wilmington, Delaware, WDEL. Uh, we're coming back. We got calls from New York, North Carolina, and more coming up. Don't go anywhere. This is America at Night. With Rich Valdez. Call now, 833-4-VALDEZ. That's 833-482-5337. 833-4-VALDEZ. That's Valdez with an S. Glad to be on your show, Rich. It's just an amazing broadcast that I hope the rest of America listens to every day. America at night with Rich Valdez. Call now 833-4 Valdez. That's 833-482-5337. 833-4-Valdez. That's Valdez with an S. All right, so check this out. The Alabama police have now issued arrest warrants for the Riverfront brawl that was caught on video. The fight broke out at Riverfront Riverfront Park over a pontoon boat, potentially blocking a riverboat from docking. Now, I don't know if you've seen this. If you've seen it, uh, it's surreal to watch. It's, it's It's a big brawl. Like everybody and their mother literally got involved in this fight with one mother getting hit over the head with a plastic folding chair like this was WW wrestling type of thing. And it was just surreal. What was more surreal was how quickly meme videos were created to recreate it, right? Because in, in, as this thing unfolds, and again, if you haven't seen it, I'll, I'll try and share this article so that you could take a look at it. But I got to tell you, there, it starts with a guy and another guy, and they're fighting, but in such a uh, theatrical fashion, the, the first guy that puts his hands up takes off his hat and kind of tosses it like Michael Jackson does when he does those dance moves and screams, hee hee, you know, and, and so he tosses his hat very theatrically. And so it almost looks like they're faking it in the beginning, but then, but they're going at it. And like the one guy's holding a beer and doesn't want to spill it. And he's fighting with one hand. It's just insane. And then it gets crazier and crazier and crazier. And ultimately, you know, the cops come after they hit the lady in the head with the chair and they start locking people up and they're spraying mace kind of, you know, carte blanche everywhere to just clear the area. Bizarre fight. Um, and and I, I was on Instagram earlier today and I saw some people had actually recreated this because in the real video, you see a guy swimming across uh, from wherever he was to get to the dock so that he could join the fight. Same thing happens in this funny videos. I put it on one of my Instagram stories earlier today. And if you follow me there, you might have seen it. And I just, I just didn't know who knew about this fight or not. But apparently it's a big deal. And they now have um, issued four arrest warrants in connection 
with a massive brawl. This brawl had, I don't know, 25 people that I saw at minimum, and they're trying to arrest four of them. That's fascinating. And um, they, it looks like, according to Fox News, they attacked a dock worker as onlookers screamed and recorded the chaos. Montgomery uh, Police um, Major Saba Coleman said more warrants could be issued after authorities review more footage of the brawl that drew in that uh, national attention. I, I would recommend to uh, Major Saba Coleman that he um, he talked to um, his colleagues at the FBI. They were able to find every last senior citizen couple that walked on the grass during the January 6th protests, and uh, many of them were charged with parading and, and violating other uh, federal statutes just for being in town that day. So now that's just my advice to them if you want to track people down. Because they seem to have found everybody that was at January 6th and they didn't miss anybody. Police said that um, several people were detained and charges are pending. So again, I don't know if you saw this brawl, but if you did, you could take a look at the videos in the article at Rich Valdez on Twitter, at Rich Valdez with an S. Let us uh, hit the phones. We've got a, a good slate of people here and probably not enough time to get to everybody. Let's see here. Let's go to Marie, Las Cruces, New Mexico, K-O-B-E. Go right ahead. Hi, Rich. Well, God bless you, Rich. You're, you're, you're telling the truth about the border. It's horrible. I live in the 30 minutes away from El Paso, Texas. And uh, born and raised in Las Cruces, New Mexico, uh, Hispanic. And I tell you, we're scared of what's going on. I mean, daily, there's like people are safe. You know, daily that there's 500 coming in. Heck no, there's about 5,000 people coming in daily. So people, crazy. you know, get get scared. This is crazy. And our little town of Las Cruces used to be kind of a peaceful place. Now the crime's going up. And a lot of my friends who are low income who go for for food, they say they can't even get food anymore because the lines are like three hours to get free food now. And, you know, for a lot of seniors and low-income people. And New Mexico is low-income, but the thing is, uh, Governor Grisham is actually giving them food stamps. We People got letters, um, people that got food stamps, got right. letters from the governor saying, you do not have to show proof of ID or proof of SSI to get food stamps now. Wow. So well, if that's the case, Marie, people. how is anybody going to survive? I mean, again, the, these social safety net programs, they're designed to help people that are in need and it's not meant for to be forever. So, uh, you know, I get it. There's always going to be a, a group of people that are in that need. And if the Americans that need help uh, uh, can't get it because non-Americans who came here uninvited or maybe Biden did invite them. Let me rephrase that. But either way, I mean, at some point you have to say, look, I'm happy to feed any hungry kid until I, I can only feed my own kids. Then I have to say, I'm sorry, I can't feed that kid because I got to feed my kid. Right. And it, it's a terrible situation to be in, but it's the one that they're in. So anyway, thanks, Marie, for the call uh, from Las Cruces, New Mexico, K-O-B-E. And thank you for your kind words. God bless you, too. We're coming straight back, doing a speed round with everybody that's on hold. Don't go anywhere. This is America at Night with Rich Valdez. America at Night with Rich Valdez. All right, we're in the speed round. Everybody's got like 15 seconds. Let's go to Larry Newport, North Carolina, WTKF. You're on with Rich Valdez. Welcome. Hey there, young whippersnapper. What, let me ask you something. Why in the hell do all the people in New York City hate Donald Trump? Yeah. And now you're talking about like Alvin Bragg and the prosecutors or who are you talking about specifically? The, the whole the, the people that didn't vote for him. If Donald, if the the oh. people of New York City, they, well, that's they, because he ran as a Republican. Uh, I don't think uh, I don't believe we'll see a Republican elected in New York. Um, 
for a long time. Maybe you know, maybe if Adams does a more of a of a job to destroy the city, then maybe. But even then, I mean, to say Republican New York, it's it's like you meet people and you go, "You're a Republican." They go, "Why? Why are you a racist? Why are you this? Why do you favor the rich? Why do you?" I mean, the the term is so tainted. Um, I just don't see it ever making any progress. But that's that's why, because the Democrats have done an amazing job at poisoning the minds of people to think that Republican means bad. Anyway, thank you, Larry. Big shout out to you in Newport, North Carolina, WTKF. I hope to talk to you again soon. Godspeed, my friend. Let us continue, shall we? All right, let's go over here. Let's go to Jan, Salem, Missouri, KTRS. Jan, go right ahead. Oh, hi, Rich. Um, I really enjoy your show. I have a comment. You're welcome. I have a comment. Um, I agree with what you were talking about uh, earlier uh, with um, President Trump um, being a pacifist. Yes. Um, And recently, um, contrary to that, he said, um, you come after me and I go after you. Um, I think that was a couple of days ago. And I thought that was very good for people who don't like us, who hate us, um, to be on guard. (laughs) Right. I think you're um, right. I think you've raised a really good point that Trump needed to to just say, look, I'm punching back. If you're going to come after me, I'm coming after you. I think it's a fair statement. I don't think he was threatening anyone. I think they... The media tried to frame that like witness intimidation or coming after, you know, him, you know, um, you know, trying to make it look like it was something violent. But I think he's just being fair and he's saying, look, we're in a political campaign. And if you're going to throw mud at me, I'm throwing mud at you. And people need to get over themselves. Right. They got to just stop being such uh, such wusses when it comes to Trump. Jeez, let the guy talk. Anyway, Jen, thank you. Big shout out to Salem, uh, Missouri, KTRS. Uh, lovely to hear your voice. Hoping that you'll call back again soon, Jan. And um, let's see, where do we go from here? We got uh, our our buddy Bill in Dagsboro, Delaware on WXDE, um, letting us know that we have a winner in Florida for the Mega Millions. There's a winner. Good for them. It wasn't me, so it can't be that good. And uh, let's uh, wrap up here with Jane very quickly. Saratoga, New York, WGDJ. Go right ahead. I'd like to present a quick question. Since um, Biden is so interested in nailing Trump to the cross, I think that all of us, when we go and he's out on a rally, I think all of us need to start asking him questions. That You're right. We need to challenge him. We need to ask tough questions. Thank you, Jane. I appreciate that. Uh, what is the story, right? Hold him accountable. Anyway, hasta la próxima. Take care. Good night. And God bless. I'll be here again with you tomorrow. God willing, I'm Rich Valdez.